an ideal Rankine cycle with a single reheater operates at a steam generator pressure of 200 bar and a condenser pressure of 0.04 bar. The temperature at the steam generator exit is 600 degrees C. The temperature at the reheater exit is also 600 degrees C. The reheater operates at 15 bar. 10% of the mass flow rate exiting the first turbine stage is extracted before the reheater. The extracted steam enters an open feed water heater. The exit of the condenser is a saturated liquid. Determine the thermal efficiency of the cycle. So this is a Rankine cycle question and the most important thing we need to do at the beginning of all Rankine cycle questions is read the description of the cycle and make sure we can figure out what components are in this cycle. So that's the way we're going to start our given information. So a diagram, a schematic diagram of all of these components and how they're hooked together and what the properties are at different state points is critical to getting this one going. So the first thing we read here is this Rankine cycle has a single reheater. So we know we're going to have to take the turbine and show a two-stage turbine with a reheater in between. So I'll begin drawing this over on the turbine side. So that's turbine one. And we'll put a reheater in between. And then down here, turbine two. So the exit of this turbine goes into the reheater, and then we go that direction. So those are our two turbines and a reheater in between. So we know we need a steam generator feeding this first turbine. So we'll put a steam generator there. Exit the steam generator going into the turbine and also the steam generator operates at 200 bar. Okay. Steam generator pressure 200 bar and a condenser pressure 0 0.04 bar. So we can go down to the bottom end here and the second turbine discharges into a condenser. So out of there into there. Now we're going to come out of the condenser into a liquid pump and out of a liquid pump go back and take a look at our problem statement and notice here it says the extracted steam enters an open feed water heater so this system has an open feed water heater so there's both a reheater and an open feed water heater so the open feed water heater will be over here first pump discharges into it and then the second pump takes us the rest of the way back up to the steam generator pressure and back here it talks about 10 percent of the mass flow rate exiting the first turbine so that's here is extracted before the reheater and the extracted steam enters the feed water heater so we extract steam from this point and go into the feed water heater. So this is the feed water heater. Shown the direction of all of the flows already, I believe. So that's what this system looks like. And remember this is 0 0.04 bar. A couple of other temperatures given here. We have 600 degrees C at the exit of the steam generator. So here we have 600 degrees C and the reheater exit is also 600 degrees C. And there's one more pressure given in the problem statement as well. The reheater operates at 15 bar. So this is 15 bar. That means that the feed water heater is also at 15 bar. So everything from the discharge of this pump around to the inlet of this turbine is 200 bar and it drops down to 15 bar. So the reheater and the feed water heater are operating at 15 bar 
and then through the second turbine drops down to 0 0.04 bar and then through this pump back up to 15 bar. So we'll label this as pump 1 and that as pump 2. This says that the exit of the condenser is a saturated liquid. So we'll get that on here as well. So right here we have a saturated liquid. It's very, very common for the exit of the condenser to be a saturated liquid. So the other thing we should do to make this diagram complete is get all of our state points numbered here. So we're going to have to refer to these locations. So just go around and make sure we number all of these state points. So 6 is going to be the discharge of turbine 1, the inlet to the reheater, and also the inlet to the feed water heater. And uh, 7, and then finally 0.8 down here. We were told 10% of the mass flow rate exiting the first turbine is extracted before the, the reheater. So this flow rate here, m dot, is equal to 10% of m dot 5. Okay, so m dot 5 is the flow rate coming out of the steam generator. 10% of that turns the corner here and goes to the feed water heater. So that tells us all of the given information that we're uh, given on the diagram. So that'll really help us when we're trying to figure out what we know and what don't we know. So what we're asked to find here is the thermal efficiency. And that's a very common thing to find for these things. Thermal efficiency is the net work divided by the heat added. So in order to get the net work, we're going to have to find the work transfer in both turbines and both pumps because those all contribute to the network. And in order to find the heat added to this cycle, we're going to have to figure out the heat added in the steam generator and the reheater, because those are both added from outside of the cycle. So those things we're certainly going to have to find. So basically we need to look at every one of the components in this and, and, and find a work or a heat transfer. So our assumptions We've built quite a few lists of assumptions by this point in the course, so we're going to actually uh, put down some of the assumptions right away here. We'll be operating under steady state. We know that kinetic and potential energy is negligible. A very important one is happening because of this word here. It's an ideal Wrangel cycle. Okay? Ideal means that the turbines and the pumps have an isentropic efficiency of 100%. So turbines and pumps are reversible. And we're also going to say they're adiabatic. So constant entropy is what that implies. And we'll also say the heat exchangers are at constant pressure. OK. So now we're ready to begin the analysis. So let's start off getting a general form of our energy equation that we can use for any of the components. So again, we begin with our most general form of the energy equation to make sure we don't miss anything. So the unsteady term, rate of change of energy, is heat transfer rate minus the work rate plus the summation over the inlets, m dot inlet, h inlet, plus kinetic energy, plus potential energy, minus, same thing at the exits. Steady flow, no kinetic energy, no potential energy. So we get a general form of the working equation that we can use for any of these, uh, any of these points. So now we can write down what's left of this equation, and we can apply that to each of the components as we go through this solution. So Q dot for the control volume, 
minus the work rate for the control volume is equal. Notice I'm going to take the inlets and exits and move them to the other side of the equation. So the exits actually become positive. And it doesn't matter which component we look at. There's only one exit. Even the open feed water heater only has one exit. So I'm going to call this M dot E H E. But the inlets, depending on what component we're looking at, there could be more than one inlet. You know, the only one that's true for is the feed water heater. It has two inlets. So we do have to leave this as a summation over the inlets of M dot inlet H inlet. So that would be our simplified form of the energy equation that we can apply to each of these components. Now we could also divide this through by mass flow rate for a bunch of the components and it'll simplify it quite a bit. But we'll see that happen as we look at each component. So we're going to begin by looking at turbine 1. The heat transfer rate is 0 and also there's only one inlet. So the work of turbine 1 so I've also divided through by the mass flow rate, is going to be equal to H5 minus H6. 0.5, we know the pressure at 5 is 200 bar, and the temperature at 5 is 600 degrees C. So therefore, H5 is equal to 3537, 0.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And while we're there, we know that we need to look up S5 because we're going to be treating this as an isentropic turbine. And so S5 is 6.5048 kilojoules per kilogram. S6 is equal to S5 because it's an isentropic turbine. And also P6 is equal to 15 bar. So we can get the properties at 0.6 as well. And we find out H6 is 2821, 0.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So now we have these two enthalpies. We can calculate the work for turbine 1. It's 3537.6 minus 2821.51. So that equals 716.09 kilojoules per kilogram. We can move right away on to turbine 2 and do exactly the same thing there. P7 is 15 bar and T7 is 600 degrees C. Therefore, from the tables, H7 is equal to 3694.0 kilojoules per kilogram. And while we're there, S7 is equal to 7.8385 kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. S8 equals S7, another isentropic turbine. And P8 is all the way down at the condenser pressure, 0 0.04 bar. So when we take a look at this value of entropy, down at this pressure, we find it's between SF and SG. So S7 is in between SF and SG. That tells us that this is a mixture. So we take the value of entropy and go ahead and calculate a quality. And it turns out the quality at 0.8 is equal to 0.921. And then we can use that quality to calculate our enthalpy. So H8 is HF plus the quality times HFG, and we calculate that out, and it gives us 2362.16 kilojoules per kilogram. So the work for turbine 2 is H7 minus H8, which is equal to 3694.0 minus 2362.16 and that gives us 1331.84 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the two turbines. Now we need to go to the two pumps. So pump one, take a look first of all at the inlet conditions. 
P1 is the inlet, that's down to the condenser pressure, 0 0.04 bar, and we know it's a saturated liquid. So we have a pressure, and we have the fact that it's a saturated liquid. So we can look in the saturation tables, and we find H1 is 121.46 kilojoules per kilogram. And while we're there, we will need V1, and that's 1.004 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per kilogram. Now the reason that we looked up the specific volume there is remember this is a liquid pump. So we can calculate the work for that pump from negative the integral of V dP. And the reason that this is easy is because it's liquid this specific volume is a constant and can come outside the integral sign. So this is just equal to minus V1 P2 minus P1. And we have all of those numbers. So the specific volume, one, remember the negative, 1.0040 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per kilogram, multiplied by P2, which is 15 bar, so that's 1,500 kilopascals, minus 4 kilopascals. So the work of pump 1 is negative 1.502 kilojoules per kilogram. Now notice something about the Rankine cycle. Got lots of calculating left to do, but notice turbine 2 is producing 1300 kilojoules per kilogram and pump 1 is only 1.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So the pumps consume far, far less energy than the turbines produce, and that's very typical of a Rankine cycle. Now notice also that we calculated the work for this pump directly, meaning that we calculated it from the integral of VDP. That means that we can still use the energy balance on this pump to get the enthalpy at its exit. So the energy balance for the pump tells us that the work for pump 1 is equal to H1 minus H2. So notice we've assumed that it's an adiabatic pump, which we already have in our assumptions list. So this tells us that H2 is equal to H1 minus the work for pump 1. And of course we have numbers for both H1 and the work, so we can go ahead and calculate H2. It'll be 121.46 plus 1.502. Notice there's a negative in the equation, and we're substituting in a negative number, so that's a positive sign. And that gives 122.96 kilojoules per kilogram at the exit of pump 1. Now we've got the exit of pump 1, we can move on to our feed water heater. And we need to look at the feed water heater to get the inlet conditions for the second pump. So in the feed water heater, of course, there's no work or heat transfer, but there are two inlets. So our energy of equation becomes 0 equals the two inlets, m dot 2 h2 plus m dot 6 h6. So this is the flow coming from the first pump. This is the flow coming from the extraction point, And then one exit, minus m dot 3 h3. Now notice we know h2. We also know h6 because we already looked at the first turbine, and we have its exit conditions. So we can use this equation to get h3. Now, just a note about the flow rates. I'm going to take this equation and divide through by m dot 3. So I still have 0 on the left-hand side. m dot 2 over m dot 3 times h2 plus m dot 6 over m dot 3 times h6 minus h3. Now the reason I do this, if we go back to our diagram and we think about m dot 6 over m dot 3 and m dot 2 over m dot 3, see what those are. Well, m dot 6 is the mass flow rate that turns the quarter and heads this way. And that is 10% of m dot 5. But of course the mass flow rate at 5 and at 3 are the same. So that means that m dot 6 
divided by m dot 3 is 0.1. Also, if 0.1 goes here, it means 0.9 goes here. So the mass flow rate at 2 divided by the mass flow rate at 3 is 0.9. So we can go down and we can say that this ratio here and this ratio here are both known. This is 0.9 and this is 0.1. So this is the extraction and this is the main flow coming from the first turbine. And this is the main flow coming from the first pump. So all of this can be used to calculate H3. So the numbers here are H3 is 0.9 times 122.96, that's our H2 that we just found, plus 0.1 times 2821.51. And so H3 works out to 392.82 kilojoules per kilogram. And this is happening at 15 bar. Okay, the whole feed water heater is at 15 bar. Well, if we take a look at this value of enthalpy at 15 bar, we learn that it's a subcooled liquid. So we want to look up the specific volume because we're going to need that for the pump calculation. And it turns out that's 1.0388 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per kilogram. So now we have what we need to go on to the, the second pump. So we'll do the work calculation first. Work of pump 2, negative integral from 3 to 4 VDP, which of course is minus V3 times P4 minus P3, which is equal to minus 1.0388 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per kilogram times the pressure difference which is 200 bar which is 200 and then two more zeros to get kilopascals minus 1500 kilopascals so important that we get both of those pressures in kilopascals so the work of pump 2 comes out to negative 19.218 kilojoules per kilogram. Now just like we did for the first pump, we've calculated the work for the pump directly so we can use the first law to calculate the enthalpy at its exit. So the work of pump 2 is equal to H3 minus H4. Therefore H4 is equal to H3 minus the work of pump 2. So putting numbers into this, we can get H4 is 392.82 plus 19.218 is equal to 412.04 kilojoules per kilogram. And again, the reason we did that is because we also have to look at the steam generator and we need to know the enthalpy coming into it. So the steam generator we have to look at because in the efficiency equation we're going to have Q added in the denominator and the steam generator contributes to that. So Q for the steam generator, of course the work is zero, so we've set that to zero. So Q is just H5 minus H4. And again, we've already looked up all of these enthalpies, so we just need to put them in. 35, 37. 0.6 minus 412.04. So that Q is 3125.56 kilojoules per kilogram. And likewise the reheater, we have to look at it because it's heat supplied from the outside. So Q in the reheater, again work transfer is zero, H7 minus H6. And we have both of these, 3694.0 minus 2821.51 is equal to 872.49 kilojoules per kilogram. 
So we have all the work and heat transfers that we need in order to calculate the efficiency. So we go to the efficiency and we first of all remember the definition of thermal efficiency is the net work divided by the heat added. Now here's where we need to be really careful because we've got an extraction point and an open feed water heater in play here. And I'm going to go back up and look at the diagram just to show what's going on. Now remember we've calculated all of these work and heat transfers on a per unit mass basis. Well, let's think about doing this for think about every kilogram of steam that comes out of the steam generator. So for every kilogram of steam that comes out of the steam generator, all of that goes through turbine 1, so we don't have to do anything there. The problem though is that point 1 of it turns the corner and only point 9 kilograms goes through the reheater, through this turbine, through the condenser, and through this pump, and then it joins back together with the point one in the feed water heater. So again, the full kilogram goes through this pump. So pump two, the steam generator, and the turbine, or turbine one, all have the full flow through them, but the reheater, turbine two, the condenser and pump one have a reduced amount of flow through them, only 0.9 of the flow that goes through here. So since we've calculated each of the work transfers and heat transfers on a per unit mass basis, we need to take into account the fact there's less flow through these components. So we'll see how that's done down here when we do our calculation for efficiency. So the net work is going to be the work for turbine 1, it has the full flow through it, plus the work for pump 2, it has the full flow through it, plus 0.9 times the work for turbine 2, plus the work for pump 1. So the 0.9 is here because each of these only has 0.9 kilograms going through it, compared to each of these which have the full kilogram going through it. In the denominator, Heat added comes from the steam generator and the reheater. So the steam generator, again, has the full flow through it, but the reheater only has 0.9 kilograms going through it for every kilogram that goes through the steam generator. So we need to be very careful to derate these two components and this component to get their contribution to the total work and total heat added correct. So now we're ready to put numbers into all of this. So this is 716.09 minus 19.218. Remember the pump work is negative, so it's going to reduce the network. Plus 0.9. This turbine is 1331.84 and this pump is 1.502. Heat added, steam generator. 3125.56 plus 0.9 times 872.49. So this works out to 48.434%. So we can conclude that our thermal efficiency is 48.4%.